Okay, all right. Um, so my name's Rachel Yap, and I'm going to be giving a talk today on fear. Speaking to an organizer of today's events on Skype one day, I was asked if I would consider giving a talk. I was excited, yet freaking out all at the same time. Um, I said I'd think about it and get back to him, and he asked me, why not just decide now? My reply, fear. So I thought about it a little more and decided that that would be the topic of my talk today. What is it? Does it have positive or negative effects on, the, on, um, on our lives? How is it relevant to the transition? What could fear look like in a resource-based economy, or would there even be a social basis for it? As I discuss the fear shared by many of us, I would like you to remember the role that our dominant socioeconomic system plays in reinforcing them, and to ask yourself, whether we are capable of constructing a society that minimizes the expression of the more socially destructive and personally crippling fears. So I'd like to, talk, uh, I'd like to start my talk by asking what you fear. Is spiders, snakes, small, uh, small spaces, fear itself? Well, this is a list of the top reported fears in North America. Coming in at number 10, we have the fear of thunder and lightning at 2% of the population. And in ninth place, agoraphobia at 2.2%. Next, we have claustrophobia at 25 And number seven, the fear of flying coming in at 6.5%. And just as a side note, this figure has risen in the US since the events of September 11th, by the way. And in sixth place, sixth place, we have sociophobia, or the fear of people or social situations. Now, I'm assuming that that's none of you here. If so, congratulations, you're doing an awesome job. <laughs> All right, and then at number five, we have, um, we have acrophobia, or the fear of heights. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that video going around recently, um, the guys who um, climbed the Shanghai Tower. Well, if you're anything like me, you watched that and your stomach was turning. And, like, the views from the top, horrific, absolutely, I, they're crazy. All right, and number four, we have fear of the dark at 11%. And in third place, arachnophobia, the fear of spiders. That's a pretty common one. But just as a side note, does anybody know what this fear is? I'm not going to try and say it because I've tried many times and it doesn't end so well. Well, I can hear it, a few people saying it. Um, it's the fear of long words. <laughs> yeah, isn't that great? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I was looking through a list of all the fears I could find, and there's fears for absolutely everything. There's fear of the color red. There's, you know, crazy things like that. Um, so if you've got a problem, there's a fear for that. <laughs> and in his book, Pseudo City, uh, D. Hall and Wilson wrote, coincidentally, there is a masochistic primary care physician with the fear of long words, uh, curled up in an alleyway across the street. He has been whispering anti-establishmentarianism to himself over and over for two days now, experiencing up to one orgasm every three hours as a result of the pain. <laughs> Going back to what Matt was saying about sadomasochism, I guess. Um, so can anyone guess what the second biggest fear is? You get it, death. I guess this one makes sense. We don't know what that experience is like. The religious fear their scary place, some fear physical pain, some fear regret. So yeah, it makes sense that this one's near the top at 68% of the population. And does anybody know the most commonly reported fear in the whole of North America? Anybody know what it is? Damn, you guys are good. You're so good. Yeah, public speaking. And I tell you, I can see why. I'm sweating, my heart's racing, and I am shaking head to toe just at the thought of you knowing that I'm shaking head to toe right now. <laughs> I, I understand the, the problem with that, by the way. But isn't that crazy? Our biggest fear involves talking to volumes of other people. We're more okay with dying than speaking publicly. <laughs> As Jerry Seinfeld said, we'd be better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. It doesn't seem right if we want to improve the world. After all, there's a lot of people to talk to. But let's stop and look at this for a moment. According to the World Health Organization, the number one cause of death to human beings in the so-called developed world is coronary heart disease. 
not spiders or other people or that psychotic mass murderer from the film you watched the other night. Yet this one didn't even make the list. It's called cardiophobia. People freaked out about getting heart disease, certain that their hearts aren't beating properly or that they will suffer a terrible death. Two of the major risk factors for heart disease are related to poor diet and stress, both of which are heavily reinforced by the market system in its propagation of the material excesses inherent to its structure. I'm sorry, but this is one of the few more logical fears based on our current cause of death data. So that begs the question, if our fears don't necessarily match reality, then why do we have them at all? We as humans are exceptionally, exceptionally malleable. Our wants are malleable, our dreams are malleable, so it should come as no surprise that our fears are also up for manipulation. The best case, I, uh, the best case study I know of to support this is the case of Little Albert. The case of Little Albert was conducted by behaviorist John B. Watson and graduate student Rosalie Rayner. Nine-month-old Albert was initially exposed to various stimuli, including a white rabbit, a rat, and burning newspapers, amongst others, to which Albert showed no fear. The next time Albert was exposed to each stimulus, a loud noise would sound, which would cause Albert to cry. They continued this process until only the exposure um, created this response. And Watson and Rayner wrote, the instant the rat, uh, the instant, oh no, that's not where I am, the instant the rat was shown, sorry guys, um, the baby began to cry. Almost instantly, he turned sharply to the left, fell over on his left side, raised himself on all fours, and began to crawl away so rapidly that he was caught with difficulty before reaching the edge of the table. Mm -hmm. There we go. Knowing this, it's no surprise that our fears get exploited day after day by our society, from advertising to political policy to presidential elections. Fear-mongering is not a new tactic to get us to behave a particular way. It has been known for quite some time. All right. If you're easily offended, I suggest you close your eyes right now, since my next slide is somewhat graphic. And I didn't want to not put it in because I liked it way too much. So. But these, these are stills from real adverts. So if you're going to close your eyes, do it now. The advertising industry is well aware that fear sells. This is also known as shock advertising. Isn't that nice? Jeez. Um, so fear is an incredibly strong emotion that can be manipulated to steer people into making emotional rather than reasoned choices. You're putting yours and your child's life at risk if you don't buy this car. You're worthless if you don't buy this accessory. You'll get whatever disease if you don't buy this unheard of remedy, etc. This makes other people think that if they buy a product or follow a certain ideology, that they too will be happy, healthy, or successful. There is evidence to show that shock advertising is a highly effective persuasion technique. And over the last several years, Advertisers have continued to increase their usage of fear in ads in what has been called a never-ending arms race in the advertising business. Okay, if you close your eyes, you can look back again now. In 1964, in the midst of the Vietnam War, a presidential election was taking place in the US. Lyndon Johnson was up for re-election. Tensions over nuclear war were running high. The television advert for Johnson's campaign, entitled Daisy, was extremely effective in using in using fear uh, to motivate people's behavior, in this case, concerning voting. The advert begins with a little girl standing in a field with birds singing in the background, and she's counting as she picks the petals off a daisy. When she reaches nine, an ominous voice is heard counting down a missile launch. The camera zooms in until her pupil completely fills the screen, blacking it out. And when the countdown reaches zero, the blackness is replaced by a mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. Over the sounds of the explosion, President Johnson states, these are the stakes, to make a world in which all of God's children can live or go into the dark. We must, uh, we must either love each other or we must die. Another voice then says, vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay at home. Powerful, hey? 
Do you want to be the person responsible for nuclear war just because you voted for the wrong guy or didn't vote at all? I wouldn't. So, last example, the war on terror. I'm sure you're all familiar with this one. The fear experienced by what the Western world after the events of September 11th encouraged support for the subsequent war. Former National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski argues that the use of the term war on terror was intended to deliberately generate fear as it obscures reason, intensifies emotions, and makes it easier for demagogic po politicians to mobilize the public on behalf of policies they want to pursue. So before we go any further, let's look at what it is exactly that we're dealing with. What is fear? Fear can be described as an emotion induced by a perceived threat. It is a motivating force which arises from the ability to recognize danger, which leads to an urge to confront it or flee from it, and is also known more commonly as the fight or flight response. In extreme cases of fear, affectionately known as horror and terror, a freeze paralysis is also possible. So what happens in our brain when we experience a fear response? The area of the limbic system, known as the amygdala, is the part of the brain that is responsible for most brain activity um, associated with fear. The amygdala releases hormones that influence fear and aggression when we feel threatened. These hormones put us in a state of alertness in which they are ready to run or fight, the fight or flight response, and is regulated by the hypothalamus. A reaction to fear, known as the fear response, is created by three main hormones. Epinephrine, or adrenaline, regulates increases in heart rate and metabolism, and also the dilation of the blood vessels and air passages. Norepinephrine increases heart rate, blood flow to skeletal muscles, and the release of glucose from energy stores. And cortisol increases blood sugar and helps with metabolism, and is also known as the stress hormone. So basically, it's perfectly legitimate to blame this response on your hormones. So once the threat has passed, the amygdala and the hippocampus, responsible for our emotional memory, get involved. They record a wide variety of details surrounding the event through synaptic plasticity and send the information to the medial prefrontal cortex, where it becomes learned and is stored for, future sim um, for similar future situations. Plasticity and memory formation in the amygdala are generated by activations of the neurons in the region. The notion that this memory formation occurs because of fear conditioning is supported by experimental data. In some cases, this forms permanent fear responses such as post-traumatic stress disorder or a phobia. This is what can make fear so difficult to shake. And I think that we can all envision, uh, all envision how this is directly promoted by our socioeconomic system. So with all our technology and current understandings of how this works, why don't we just get this pesky amygdala removed? Just so we can get on with our lives and live happily ever after, you know? Just think about this for a moment though. If you were given the option to get rid of fear, to live your life without it, would you? Shut up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> you totally put me off now. Um, you know, to, uh, to not have to enjoy that sinking feeling of failure or being able to do whatever it is that your heart desires without creating reasons for yourself why you shouldn't do it. To just flick a switch and bam, plain sailing. Well, let me start by explaining a famous case of a lady known only as SM. Some of you may or may not be familiar with this case, I'm not sure. Um, so now this lady is extraordinary in the sense that she does not and cannot experience fear. Great. You know, um, great you may think, or you might be envious. Well, let's look a little bit closer. She has a damaged amygdala, and her case has actually played a pivotal role in linking the amygdala with fear. In order to test her fear response, or lack thereof, um, the uh, they directly exposed her to some of the most effective go-to fear response triggers that they could think of. Firstly, she was subjected to snakes and spiders. Then, they took her to a notoriously haunted house. And lastly, they showed her scary movies. 
None of these activities Belly got any fear response out of her. She responded with only intrigue and inquisitiveness. She was asked during this exercise to rate her fear on a, you know, her fear levels on a scale of one to 10, one being no fear and 10 being unbearable. And from everything that she was uh, subjected to, nothing got a response higher than two. When asked why she would want to hold in the pet store uh, the exotic animals that she was told could harm her, she responded um, that she was overcome with curiosity. However, despite not experiencing fear or being able to recognize it even on the faces of others, she is still able to experience other emotions. And according to the study, she was laughing and leading the group through the haunted house. She also ended up scaring half of the staff by her lack of fear. <laughs> it's crazy. Wouldn't it be nice to just live without that, all that fear? You know, like, wouldn't that be great? But with this in mind, why on earth do we experience it? Why does it even exist? Well, to answer this question, we need to go back in history just a little bit. Fear, as mentioned before, will often elicit a fight or flight response. In order for us to have evolved to our current stage, we would have had to have been able to survive attacks from predators. This response to flee is likely one of the major reasons our species has survived as long as it has, the ability to remove ourselves from imminent danger. But back to SM for a minute. While she doesn't experience fear or any of the anxiety associated with it, she also doesn't hold back from putting herself in dangerous situations. For example, she has two options for her walk home from work each day. She can either take a path through a well-lit area, or, um, which takes a little bit longer, or she can take a shorter journey through a dark car park in an area that's notorious for crime. Which way would you go in that scenario? <laughs> Did you say the second one? Okay. Um, well, having no concept of fear, SM chooses the second option. As a result of this, she's been mugged and had her life threatened on numerous occasions. And despite this, she still walks that way daily. Well, why? Well, fear is a vital part of our survival, not just to alert us to imminent danger, but every time we experience that fear, it gets embedded in our brains and we then use that new brain path to avoid that situation or similar in the future. A bit like our own little guardian angel for want of a better term. We also need to understand the social causes and reinforcements for fear. We have a social system predicated on cutthroat competition and therefore one in which we see other human beings as enemies and potential threats to our survival. Many of us live day to day with the fear that we will not have access to or that we will lose access to our basic human needs, which generally revolves around the fear of not being able to earn enough money to meet these needs. We rely on fear or the learned responses to it every single day of our lives. It stops us from walking out in front of a bus, it cautions us from getting too close to an edge, and it stops us from leaving ourselves vulnerable to attack. So in general, fear can be categorized. <laughs> this is my humor right here, okay. Um, fear can be categorized as rational, meaning a logical and reasoned reaction for a threat, such as fear experienced when having a loaded gun held to your head, or irrational, which mean, meaning not a logical or reasoned reaction, such as fear of zombies or something else for which we have no evidence. Wouldn't it be nice to simply categorize each fear as either rational or irrational? It sure would make overcoming them that much easier since we would know which ones were reasonable and which ones needed work. However, it's not that easy and I will not fall victim to that fallacy. So when we look closer at fear responses, we can often see both rationality and irrationality at play. For example, are you familiar with the term going postal? I'm sure most of you are. Well, this was coined to mean extreme anger to the point of violence and is usually associated with a work environment. This phrase came into existence after Patrick Sherrill, uh, seen in the picture right there, um, shot 14 employees and wounded six others at a post office in Oklahoma in 1986. Immediately following the attack, he committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. The day before, post office employee Cheryl was reprimanded by his two supervisors, and this would surely end in his dismissal. 
anger over the reprimand, coupled with the anxiety that he was going to be fired, are said to be contributing motives behind the attack the following morning. So, okay, is this a, rea uh, is this a rational reaction to the fear of losing his job? No. And yes. The act of murdering people on these grounds, or likely any, is not exactly based on logic and reason. However, remembering that our fight or flight response contribute, that our fight or flight response contributed to our survival from the cave days and how society has changed, our access to the necessities of life have also changed. Living in a monetary system, money is required to provide us with our basic needs of food and shelter. This guy was convinced that he would be losing his job the next day. It is entirely possible that to him, this meant death. He would no longer be able to feed or provide shelter to his family. Fear of losing access to his needs in this scenario puts a somewhat rational spin on the strength of his reaction. That's not to condone his actions, by the way. I just want to make that clear. But merely express that things are not black and white when it comes to fear. So to summarize, can fear potentially be bad? Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Bad? Yes. Rational? Yep. Irrational? Yeah. It all depends. So to conclude, what role does fear play in our future? How does this relate to the transition from here to there? We have the technological capabilities right now to move towards a resource-based economy, but why aren't we there? Our values are the reason. We have to fix ourselves at the same time we try and fix the world. Technology can be created, by, uh, created and implemented logically and rationally using the scientific method, whereas our values often are derived from a less rational and logical basis. Take fear. It can be rational, which is useful or ish, irrational, ugh, ugh, or irrational, which is heavily detrimental to ourselves and those around us. Logic we can do. It's the illogical, irrational behavior holding us back because it's infinitely more complicated. Nothing will change until we do, and until enough of us do significantly. We all experience fear responses to one degree or another, whether we are emotionally mature enough to admit it or not. If we're going to be the, if we're going to be the critical mass we need to be, then we've got some tough personal work ahead of us. We need to stop supporting fear-dependent institutions if we want to move towards a healthier society. We need our values to change at the same rate as the physical transition. Will fear exist in a resource-based economy? Most definitely. However, there will be no socioeconomic reinforcement for much of what we fear today. In other words, it is extremely likely that the more baseless fears that are, direct, uh, that are directly reinforced by the market system structure will no longer have any relevance. Our basic human needs will be taken care of, eliminating anxiety surrounding having these needs met. We often fear the unknown. <laughs> An ancient indigenous culture once feared the fart man, who would punish them with constipation for bad deeds. <laughs> Not understanding that their low fiber diet was most likely the culprit. But the more we understand, the less we fear. So focusing on education should help to improve this. Are we as a people riddled with metathesiophobia? Yes, I said it. The fear of change? As you can see, I, I know, you know all these stupid names for all these fears now. I've been through it so much. I mean, this is silly, though, because change is the only constant. And I have a confession to make. This talk of mine hasn't strictly been for you. I'm also here for me. I have an immense fear of public speaking, so this is my first step to kicking it in the ass. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We, need, we need to be able to talk to people and to communicate if we really care about changing the world. That's why I'm here. I care about this movement. I care about the future, and I care about this planet. One of my biggest fears is regret. Regretting not, do, regretting not doing all I can for something that I believe in so strongly. We already have enough hurdles to get past. Don't let your fear be one of them. 
Thank you for being a participant and helping me to eventually overcome this. I appreciate it. <laughs> I haven't finished. Oh. <laughs> I just, I haven't finished yet. Um, stop it. Um, I, I just hope that this, this talk has inspired you to think more about your fears so that we can move forward together as a species and as a society. Thank you. <laughs>